morning. I hope you're having a good day. We're going to continue on uh, talking about thermal chemistry. And we left off with an example that I want to talk about a little bit more. And it's another way to write if an equation is exothermic or endothermic. And this is the combustion reaction of methane. And like all the burning reactions, they're very exothermic. And we see that clearly from the delta H. The sine of delta H, or the sine of Q, if it's negative, that's going to be an exothermic. But you can also write the heat as an actual product if it's exothermic. So in an exothermic reaction, energy is being given off. So sometimes you'll see exothermic reactions with an actual heat in the reaction itself. And so this is an example of how you do that. And why this is sometimes helpful is you can think about this as an actual stoichiometric factor. So if you have, for example, uh, so many grams of methane, you could turn this into moles of methane. And what this reaction says is that one mole of methane creates 802 kilojoules. So it's like another type of a factor, all right? Um, the only thing tricky is you have to realize that if the energy is on the product side, then technically it's a negative number like right here. And if it's a reactant, if the energy is a reactant, it would be endothermic. I showed up here on the chalkboard two examples of just some generic A plus B going to C, and that could be anything. But notice here are the first example, an energy term, 30 joules as a product. That's one way to see that this is an exothermic reaction. If energy is a product, it's going to be exo, and you write the delta H as negative. On the other hand, we will sometimes see endothermic reactions. And in those cases, you would write the energy as a reactant. <clears throat> this would be an endothermic reaction, and you'd have a positive delta H. So it's an alternative way to write energy quantities and stuff. And what is kind of cool is that you can make these kind of relationships like down here uh, to convert one reaction to another. So here's an example of a type of a problem, all right? In this particular reaction, which is another combustion reaction, propane is being burned, and we have here a standard molar enthalpy of combustion, ah, which is negative 2044. And if you want to know if this reaction, I just opened it up, if this reaction is endo or exo, this energy uh, sign is one way to tell. So if this is a negative delta H, this would be exothermic, all right? You could also, though, take this 2044 and you could write it as a product. So an alternative way of showing this reaction would be to say propane plus five oxygens makes three CO2s plus four waters plus 2044 kilojoules. These are some of the things you might see. Any questions? So <clears throat> you can use these relationships in all kinds of different ways. Sometimes you'll have so many grams of a reactant or a product, and you can convert that into an energy. So in this problem, 128.5 grams of CH4, the molar mass of CH4, which is one carbon and four hydrogens, about 16 grams per mole. And in this reaction, one mole of methane is being consumed, and this is the energy that's coming out. So this reaction, if you burn 128.5 grams of methane, you should end up with a pretty large amount of energy. And if Tao was going to do this with her barbecue as an example, Tao, if you were gonna do this with your barbecue, then this would be the amount of energy you'd get out. And it's quite a bit of energy. You have to be kind of cool about it. Nice having you here. Questions on this process? Cool. So, 32 grams of oxygen are combusted using this reaction right here. Let's see if we can find the amount of energy and stuff that's going to happen. So again, if you use this number, you want to go grams to moles like before. And of course, 32 grams per mole is the molar mass of O2. So this is like one mole of O2. And from there, what you want to do, you want to make the relationship between the energy and the oxygen in the reactant. 
Now notice in this case, it's two moles of O2. So you're gonna get 802 kilojoules out for every two moles of O2 that you combust. That's what this part is right here. And again, I'm literally just using the energy term. In this case, it's per moles of O2, so it's two. You should get out negative 401. Any questions? So there's lots of things you can do with these crazy delta H's, and I want to kind of summarize some of the things that you can do. This is an example for making one mole of water as a gas, so water vapor. And this number, if you look it up, is about negative 242 kilojoules. Is this exothermic or endothermic? Exo, that's right. The negative sign tells you that it's exothermic. <clears throat> Notice in this, for example, up here, there's only one mole of product. And usually, in my world, I hate using fractions. So let's say I said, oh, well, you better get rid of those fractions right now. So you multiplied everything through by two. And that's totally fine, but it will affect the energy. So this energy, you can see, is twice the old energy. If you multiply an equation through by two, multiply the delta H by two. If you multiply it through by four, multiply the delta H by four. And that's a legit thing to do when it comes to thermochemistry. You can multiply by anything, one half, a hundred, whatever you want. Just do that same thing to the delta H. Another thing you can do is you can flip reactions around. So instead of having hydrogen and oxygen as the reactants and water vapor as the product, you can also think about it as water vapor as the reactant and hydrogen and oxygen as the products. That's cool too. If you flip the equation, you change the sign. So what was very exothermic up here becomes very endothermic down there. The normal reaction which gives off lots of energy now takes a lot of energy. So if you flip an equation, you just change the sign from positive to negative or vice versa. But finally, it's also important to pay attention to the phase of matter. Water as a vapor is a lot different than water as a liquid. So if I said to find the energy of making a bowl of liquid water, you would use actually a different equation. And most of the time, the delta H's are different. So forming liquid water is a different energy than forming gaseous water. And if you wanted to form ice, all right, solid water, it would be a different number too. So then phases become really important when it comes to energy. Everything has its own energy requirement. So, if we wish to go from hydrogen and oxygen to liquid water, the easiest way probably to do this is to go through the water vapor intermediate. Combining hydrogen and oxygen creates a lot of energy. And initially that energy is essentially absorbed by the water, so it becomes a gas. But if you want to drink water, you don't want to drink vapor. <laughs> that would be like kind of weird in a science fiction way. You probably want to then chill it a little bit so that it becomes a liquid. So let's use this information to figure out how hydrogen and oxygen goes to liquid water, but we're gonna go through a vapor phase in between. And if you look these things up in the internet and stuff like that, or in the table at the back of problem set five, um, <coughs> gaseous water is gonna be exothermic. You'd have 242 kilojoules released. If we were to write this as a delta H, because energy is a product, delta H would be negative 242 kilojoules. If you go from gaseous water to liquid water, you also end up having a little bit of energy released. And in this case, it's 44 kilojoules per mole. Now, if you look at these two equations long enough, H2O as a gas is a product in the first equation, and H2O gas is a reactant in the second equation. So what people a lot of times will do is they'll add two or more equations together, canceling out some kind of common unit, which in this case is the water gas. And if you do that, H2 and the oxygen come down, we now have liquid water as our product, all the gaseous water is gone, 
and the overall energy is the sum of the individual energies. So if you take 242 plus 44, that's where this 286 number came from. And the advantage of this is actually pretty profound because um, it's easy to uh, create uh, hydrogen and oxygen, make it into gaseous water. And on a separate experiment, you can take the gaseous water and make it liquid. But doing them both can be complicated for different reasons. So people um, figured out that if you combine known equations, you can find the delta H for a reaction which might be tougher to do. And Hess was the first one to do it. There's the best picture I could find of Mr. Hess. But anyway, Hess was the dude that said, aha, you take two reactions which are known and combine them to get some new equation, and this energy is going to be the product. You literally add the individual energies together. In the problem set this week, uh, if we saw it yesterday or if we'll see it today or tomorrow, there was one example of two combustion reactions. All right, and burning things is easy. <laughs> fire, fire. No, seriously, you just light a fire, to light a match, and boom, these things like go up like crazy. So burning things is easy, but we're going to combine those two combustion reactions to get a third reaction, which would be a lot tougher. So Hess's law can be a real time saver. Uh, this kind of reaction might be difficult to do, um, but these two would be easy, so you could combine them to see what's happening. Let me show you another example of Hess's law. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of taking hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas, combining them to make ammonia. And ammonia is a pretty important fertilizer that has lots of different uses for it. So let's say that we want to find this delta H, all right? And we look through books of literature, and we find this example, which is making a compound called hydrazine, N2H4, and the delta H for this reaction is positive 95.4 kilojoules. Is reaction number one endo or exothermic? Endo, that's right, it's a positive delta H, so it's gonna be endo. Now, the second reaction here has got the same hydrazine. It's reacting with hydrogen gas, and it's making two ammonias. And this is the energy part for this. And you can see that this is a negative delta H, so this is going to be an exothermic reaction. So if we want this reaction, we need to get three H2s and an N2 out of all of this, all right? And if you look at this and stuff, Two hydrogen gases are here, and there's also one hydrogen gas in the second reaction. So if we combine these two reactions together, the two plus one will make three. The one nitrogen gas will still be a reactant, but the N2H4s are gonna cancel out. <coughs> So what you can do then is literally add the equations together. Now I don't usually show all the individual pieces, but I wanna make this very clear what's happening. 2H2 and N2 are right there, plus N2H4 plus H2 then right there. And the products will be N2H4 again plus 2NH3. And again, on these kind of steps, you wanna cancel things that are on both sides. So N2H4 is on both sides. Also, there's an H2 there and 2H2 right there. So if you wipe out the N2H4, combine the H2s together, lo and behold, this is the desired reaction. This is what we want. And if we want to find this delta H, delta H3, it's literally as easy as adding those two numbers together this delta H, negative 92.2 kilojoules. Hess's law can be really, really useful. Yeah. Uh, does one have to be endo and one exo, or can they both be endo? Cool, they can both be endo, they can both be exo, and you can have one of both. It doesn't matter, Avenir. The cool thing is, is that if you can combine known equations to give you the unknown equation, uh, then you can add up those individual energies and see what the energy is going to be. And sometimes like it'll be endo and sometimes it'll be exo, but at least you can figure out what it's going to be. Cool question. All right. Hess's law is kind of fun. It's kind of like solving a problem. And in the companion, uh, there's a Hess's law guide which has a little bit more information. But 
Hess's law can get really complicated. Like if you have three or more equations, then there's going to be so many things to add and subtract and stuff, it can get kind of crazy. But one real good use of Hess's law is that you can figure out what's called the standard molar enthalpies of formation. And this is, um, some, this is like a bunch of data. It's collected by a group called the NIST. They're kind of a snobby group, but anyway, they're the ones that actually make sure that you have really good values for these things. And in the background of this slide, these numbers here are all kilojoules per mole for some different compounds. So this is cobalt 2 oxide, this is barium carbonate, all right? A lot of the numbers are negative, but up here is an example of one that's positive. Whatever they are, the NIST is the group that collects all these data. And all of these numbers can be really helpful, but we have to understand what the delta H of formation is. If you see a delta H with an F right there, that's the formation. And the little circle up there means standard state, so you're going to do it at roughly room temperature. But the formation means you have only one mole of compound formed, and it also means that the reactants are going to be elements in their standard states. So for this Molecule, for this example right here, this negative 124.7, that means you're going to get that amount of energy out if A, you form one mole of this thing, and B, that the reactants are elements in their standard states. So this thing has carbon and hydrogen. Hydrogen would be H2 gas, the standard form of hydrogen. Carbon is usually graphite, which is the simplest form. You wouldn't want to use diamonds, all right, or C60, something like that. This is the energy you get upon making this from carbon and hydrogen. What's that lowercase then? This is the F, the formation. Like the, he's talking about right in front of the uh, compound. Like we'll talk about that. Thank you, guys. We'll talk about that in Chem 222. C4H10, if you put it together, has a couple different forms. It's like there's a, one form where all the carbons are straight across, and there's also one that's a T. Uh, Alex, this N means that all the carbons are in a straight line. And we'll see this next term. Right on. I have such things to show you. That sounds like Hellraiser. Sorry, brought that back on. Go ahead, Brandon, get me out of this. So that's how much energy is released forming that specific compound? Yes, okay. that's right. So this one would be exothermic, but this one up here would be endothermic. That's right. Good. So here's a question. What would be the standard molar enthalpy of formation reaction for potassium permanganate? Now, the reaction is the form of the equation. And the punchline here, one mole of product, and all reactants are going to be elements in their standard states. Does anybody know, off the top of my head, or you can look at the notes, what the formula for potassium permanganate is? Nice. KMNO4. So potassium permanganate is our product. And if this is a formation, one mole of product. Now, on the reactant side, you're going to have just elements in their standard states. And to figure out the elements, you literally look at that formula. So potassium's normal form is a solid. How do you know that, Dr. Russell? Look at the periodic table. All of the black elements are solids, the reds are gases, and the couple of them there, blues, are liquids. So you literally can look at the periodic table to tell what the standard state is if you don't know. So both potassium and manganese are solids, they're black, and oxygen is one of the red elements, so you'd have it as O2. It's also a diatomic. So you must have a 1 there in front of KMNO4, so that's 1K and 1MN and 2O2. And again, you don't want to have like ozone there. You don't want to have a compound over here. You want just the elements. So for this particular example, it would be K and MN and 2O2s. 
This is a really cool, beautiful solution. I hate to use that word because it sounds kind of silly, I know, but it's really cool purple. I always love the color of KM and old purple. <coughs> I digress. All right, good. I just got a smile anyway, so that's good, yeah. Uh, questions on this? So, oops, come on. Oh, seriously? What the? All right, sorry. So, here's an example of a type of a question. All right. We're making uh, methanol. Methanol is CH3OH. And the question is, which one of these is the reaction for the enthalpy of formation? Okay? And again, the enthalpy of formation means <coughs> one mole of product, this one is out. Stop right there. You can't have a two right there. You can only have a one. All right? So E is out. So one mole of product, these all have just one mole CH3OH, and the reactants are gonna be elements in their standard state. Is CH4 an element? No, it's a compound, all right? Compounds are mixtures of elements together. So water is a compound, CH4 is a compound, CO is a compound, H2O is a compound. Uh-oh, I hope it's this one, all right. So let's double check, all right? One mole of product means one carbon, graphite usually, three plus one, four hydrogens. Hydrogen comes in twos, 2H2. But this is where it just drives me crazy, but I have to follow the rules too. One oxygen, and oxygen comes in twos. So even I, with my abhorration of fractions, I have to use fractions when it comes to heat of formations because you can only have one mole of product. The number that you're gonna be able to look up here in a little bit for methanol is per mole of methanol. It's not per two moles, which is what I'd like to do to get rid of the fractions. So you will end up using fractions when it comes to heat of formation reactions. Alex? Um, H gets a two and O gets a two because they're part of that like, number seven. No, have no fear of ice clear brew. Those seven diatomics are the ways that they exist normally. So this is like another use of them. All the other ones we have in here are gonna be single. So, so like for example, helium and argon, those are both red, but they would be just single. Awesome question. Yeah, great. So again, we can use fractions in this, like when uh, calculating the heat transformation? Like, yeah. Okay. The enthalpy of formation, Greg, is the key word, <laughs> all right? There's other types of enthalpies, but these formations we're going to see are really helpful. So if you see that formation, that's when you're going to have, uh, that's when you can use fractions. And Avenir's question was really good. It's the diatomics, have no fear of ice cold brew once again. Those are the ones that usually lead to the fractions. Why do we need these, Dr. Russell? Oh, I'm glad whoever asked that. If you know all of the enthalpies of formation, it is much easier to find the enthalpy change for a reaction. Let's go back to what Greg said. This is not a heat of formation. This is a heat of reaction. And you can find it easy if you know all the enthalpies of formation. So the NIST, which had that weird picture I showed earlier, and also at the end of problem set five, there's a multi-page document. All of those things, those heats of formation, can come in really handy. And this thing right here looks very unfriendly, so let me try and decipher it for you. If you have a reaction and you want to know if it's exo or endothermic, and how exothermic and how endothermic, this is what you want to use. And what it comes down to is you take the sum of all the enthalpies that are products. So you're going to take all of your product enthalpy of formations, and you're going to subtract from that all of the enthalpies of formations for the reactants. Now, all of the delta HFs are per mole. So if you have like a two moles of water in your reaction, which is okay for these because these aren't the formations, if you have a two, that's where the end pops in, all right? So some people think about this as the energy that you gain from the products minus the energy that you spend to get to them. That's one way to think about it. 
but this is a super powerful equation. Once in a while, of all things, I've helped the people down in the industrial tech, the car uh, place here in Mount Hood. They'll have some kind of fuel, and they'll want to know like how many joules they're getting out per gram of gasoline burned or something, or a gallon, those kind of American units. But anyway, I can use this equation, believe it or not, to help them out, because I'll figure out what is being burned, combustion reaction, products minus reactants enthalpy. I'll get some kind of number, which is the kilojoules or joules per reaction, and I can, it's, it's a really cool thing. So, anyway, I'm getting too excited here. You can also use it though in things like uh, caffeine in the body, which is probably, if you can tell, I've got a little bit of it in me. Um, you can figure out the energy released per gram ingested and stuff. So there's some really neat kind of things you can do don't be intimidated by this. The summation, again, just means add up all of them, all right? So you take all of the product enthalpies and you subtract all of the reactant enthalpies. That's really what it comes down to. So let's see some examples how this works out. <clears throat> this is an example where calcium carbonate is breaking down to calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. And let's figure out the enthalpy of the reaction. This isn't a heat of formation again, because it's not one mole of product and my reactants aren't elements in their standard states, which is cool. This is gonna be the delta H of reaction. And we can do that using this thing. And what we're gonna basically do is we're gonna look delta HF values up for CaO and CO2. That's gonna be this part, the product enthalpies and we'll subtract from it the delta HF for the calcium carbonate. And all of these things you look up in that table, you don't have to memorize any of them. So what I'm gonna do, and what you can do too if you want, you're gonna look up these individual heats of formation. And again, after problem set five, there's a multi-page document, and those values on there, that delta H column, that's what these are, they're heats of formation, and they're just numbers to look up. You don't have to memorize anything. So when I looked up calcium oxide, negative 635.1 kilojoules, and I looked up CO2, negative 393, calcium carbonate was negative 1206.2. Notice it's a negative negative, so be careful with your signs on these. But if you do all that, the overall enthalpy of this reaction, positive 177.6 kilojoules. All of the N values here, the moles, are one. One mole calcium carbonate makes one mole calcium oxide and one CO2. So I didn't use these terms explicitly because they're all one to one. I'll show you an example here in a little bit. Any questions on that? Okay. Here's another example. Same kind of game, just a different problem. This is the combustion of methanol. All right, CH3OH. In this example, CH3OH is reacting with one and a half oxygens, whatever. Anyway, making one CO2 and two waters. So just like on the last example, delta H of all the products minus delta H of all the reactants. And in that table, at the end of problem set five, or using Google, you can look up all of these individual pieces to see what they are and plug and chug. Now in this reaction, we have a two by the water and we have a three halves by the O2. And these will be the N values on the last example. So the number for water gas, we're gonna multiply by two in order to make that happen. That's what that little N means. And for oxygen, it'll be something. We'll multiply it by three halves in order to get that value. So look up the values of delta H in your text in the table, or I give it to you. Any of these kind of things are fine. But one thing that's kind of helpful, especially on this problem, is that all the elements in their standard states when it comes to enthalpy have delta HF equals zero. So what this means is that if you have oxygen gas, which is what this problem has, if you have chlorine gas, if you have calcium metal, if you have copper metal or mercury as a liquid, any of the elements in their standard states, the heats of formation, these values here, 
are going to be equal to zero. So this is a nice way to save yourself some time. Like at these tables get so long, it's kind of, you have to look up all these individual values. In this example, the O2 is going to be zero. So you don't have to look up the elements in their standard states. So in this problem, products minus reactants. We're going to look up the delta HF of CO2 and the water as a gas and the O2 and the methanol. And because the water has a 2 there, we're going to transfer that down. All these HFs are per mole, and we need 2 moles here. And we do the same thing here with the O2. We multiply the 3 halves by O2. But when you look up oxygen again, oxygen is 0. All of the elements in their standard states have delta HFs equal to zero. So it's not just O2, it's all the diatomics, like Avenir mentioned earlier, that have no clears of ice clear brews. It's going to be carbon graphite, it's going to be helium gas, all of those things. It's one less thing you have to look up in a long table. Hint, hint, hint. So CO2, negative 393.5. 2 times the water, 2 times negative 241.8. Those are the product enthalpies. And from that, we're going to subtract the reactant enthalpies. O2 is already 0. Don't have to worry about that. Methanol, CH3OH is that number. Again, make sure you pay attention. It's a negative negative, so you'd end up adding that value right there. Negative 675.6 kilojoules. So every time you burn a mole of methanol, this is used a lot of times with like cooking stoves and wild, wildlife things and stuff, um, you're actually getting out a lot of energy. A lot of energy is used by this thing. Question. So here's a question. C2H2 is acetylene. It's a compound we'll talk more in next term. But it does react with hydrogen gas to make C2H4, which is ethene. And I'd like you to find the enthalpy change for this reaction, delta H of the reaction. And notice here how I've given you a heat of formation for C2H2 and the heat of formation for C2H4. So on problems like this, products minus reactants, we've got the C2H4, which is this number right here, 52.5, and we're gonna subtract from it the delta H's of the reactants. So you subtract 226.7, we'll subtract H2, <gasps> but wait, I didn't give you H2. What's the value? Yeah, good. What's the value of H2? Zero, zero. zero, good. It's an element in a standard state. All right, cheesy instructor tricks are done now. So what you do is 52.5 minus parentheses, zero plus 226.7. And if you do that in your calculators, or you can just follow along, negative 174.2. So hint, hint, hint. If you're doing a problem and you don't have a value like this, Probably it's an element in a standard state. Some instructors have been known to do this kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, questions? All right. Calorimetry is the study of energy transfer, all right? And uh, every time uh, that you think about um, fuel mileage or, or getting from one place to the other, or even making greenhouse gases, all of these things are somehow revolving around calorimetry. Without energy, we just sit on the ground and don't do anything. <laughs> and that also applies to our vehicles and all kinds of stuff. So if you hear calorimetry, it's the study of energy. And there's different techniques that are used to study calorimetry, but I want to show you just a couple of real quick examples of how this works out. 
a lot of times, if you're going to do a calorimetry on an example uh, that it's going to be important, you want to use something that's very well insulated. And so they use something called a bomb calorimeter. And that's a fascinating uh, way to describe this, but the constant volume uh, can be important when it comes to heat transfer. We talked about how delta H enthalpy is the heat transferred at constant pressure. If you start changing volume, you get into some trouble. So the bomb calorimeter is a really cool way to measure these heats. You don't have to worry about weird volumes and stuff. And also you can figure out what's going on. So in a bomb calorimeter, and there's a whole bunch of different versions you can look up, generally you have something again which is really well insulated, but in the middle of it, you have basically a way to create your reaction. And then around your sample, you're gonna have water, and the water will absorb the energy of your fuel source. It could be gasoline, it could be film napalm, whatever, whatever is in there, it's gonna be there. The water absorbs the energy, and the calorimeter itself absorbs some energy too. And if you have a thermometer down there, and you have some way to start the reaction, which is usually through an igniter switch, um, you can actually figure this stuff out. Usually these are used, as I said, for like fuels, things that burn, all right? And uh, sometimes they'll talk about the efficiency of different fuels. They get that kind of data from bomb calorimetry, all right? That's really the best way to do it. And by the way, you don't even have to use a true like object. Uh, at Dartmouth, there was a bomb room, <laughs> and it was this thing on the roof, and you had like a place that you could ignite the sample, but some of their samples were so powerful. They were like NASA rocket fuels and stuff. And anyway, they were worried about them having a big explosion, so the walls would like collapse, and the ceiling they thought would go up and down, although that always made me really nervous and stuff. But anyway, you can have different sizes of these things depending on the source you're looking at. Um, I haven't done a lot of calorimetry, but the ones I've done have been in things like this. But again, if you're thinking about getting to Mars, you may want to think about more powerful fuel sources. Anyway, the heat created uh, by the system has to be measured if you're going to get values out. And so what a calorimetry does is just a super calibrated, very sensitive way to measure the heat exchanged. All right. So again, the system, the part that's igniting, is going to be very exothermic, a lot of energy given off. And the surroundings, which is mostly water and a little bit of calorimeter, that's where the bomb calorimeter comes in really good. They're super sensitive to these heat transfers, and you can figure it out. But remember that the heat absorbed is the opposite of the heat given off by the sample, and we'll see that here in a little bit. But anyway, if all is done, it's pretty cool. Bam! Sound effects not necessary, I know. Anyway, you can find the delta E for these kind of reactions. You can find out how efficient your fuel is, see if it's better than gasoline or something. Anyway, we're gonna do uh, what's called a coffee cup calorimeter experiment next week. And a coffee cup calorimeter, we had to work a lot to get all those coffee cups, you know, and slug them. No, seriously, we buy coffee cups because they're fairly well insulated, and you can actually do this on a fairly good scale. Nothing like what you do with a fancy one, but uh, we'll measure the heats of reaction with these insulated coffee cups, which is like a cheesy version of this. So, if you have a true calorimeter, a bomb calorimeter, all right, <clears throat> the water is absorbing the energy of your sample you put in. So, if you have a fuel source, all right, the fuel ignites, all this energy is released. Q equals MC, M, excuse me, MC delta T. So if you know how much water is around, and you can measure this on a scale, that's going to be the mass of the water. The specific heat of water is, I hope, something you all know. What's the specific heat of water? 4.184. Oh, music to my ears. Thank you. 4.184 is the specific heat of water, and that applies here too. And then you know the initial temperature of the water, and you measure it at the highest point after the little sample has ignited. That's going to be your delta T. So you can find this by just regular MC delta T. Now, what makes the bomb calorimeter a little bit more efficient is that these things are very well known and the materials have been studied a lot. You can actually get the amount of energy that the bomb calorimeter absorbs as well. 
because a lot of times these samples will have so much energy, the heat radiates all the way through the water, and some of the heat is absorbed by the calorimeter itself. So in these kind of problems, when you want to figure out how much sample energy the sample is given off, we're going to measure the heat absorbed by both the water and the calorimeter. Now in our lab next week, we're not going to worry about the calorimeter, we're just going to assume it's negligible. But if you're going to publish something, you should have good values. You should be able to measure both the energy absorbed by the water and the energy absorbed by the bomb calorimeter to get like the best value. Yeah. So the flow over us just going to be the water? In our case, yeah, that's right. It's going to be like an MC delta T. That's right. You'll have so many grams of water, that 4.184, that thermometer will measure the temperature before and then after. That's how we're going to find it. In these kind of examples, let's use an actual thing. Let's say we're going to use octane. And octane is a prime ingredient in gasoline for your vehicle. And octane, pure octane, is CaH18. It reacts, in this example, with 25 halves O2 to make 8 CO2 and 9 waters. And again, there's nothing wrong with figuring out as 2 25, 16, and 18, multiplying everything through by 2. We're going to see in this example, it's kind of nice and stuff to have it per mole, which is neat. This is, by the way, an even better bomb calorimeter. This is a little picture I found. It's a, this one's a fairly large device. Inside here, they have the actual sample that ignites and waters around it and stuff. Anyway, we're going to burn in this example one gram of octane, and we're curious <coughs> how efficient the heat is. So in this case, our water in the calorimeter started at 25.00 Celsius, and it went up to 33.20 Celsius. So this, like Avenir just said, this is going to be our delta T for the water. But the calorimeter itself is also absorbing some energy. And usually on a good calorimeter, like one of these kind, you'll have the actual value. So the calorimeter, the inside, has 1,200 grams of water. And to have a temperature like that, you can see where the energy is going to go. We're going to figure out the energy absorbed by the calorimeter, and then we're going to relate it back to the grams of octane in just a second. But remember, the water is absorbing that energy, and it's the octane which releases the energy. So we're going to do a sign change here and stuff when we're all done to reflect the energy released by the octane and not the energy absorbed by the water. The heat capacity of this particular bomb calorimeter, 837 joules per Kelvin. So this is a number that the manufacturer will give you, all right, and every bomb calorimeter is different. It doesn't have a mass term, it's just a joule per Kelvin or joule per degree Celsius. So using this information, again, what we're going to do on the next slide, we're going to figure out the energy absorbed by the water and the calorimeter, two different parts. That's going to be um, a positive number, and that's going to be equal to the negative of the energy released by the octane. And we can relate it back to grams and stuff then. Enough talk. Let's see some equations, Russell. Okay. So the first part, mc delta t, like Avenir said, this is the water in the bomb calorimeter. All right? So 4.184, that heat capacity, times the mass. Delta T, if you take the difference between the Celsius temperatures, that's 8.20 Celsius. And like we talked about earlier, a delta T in Celsius is the same as a delta T in Kelvin. So there's nothing wrong with reporting this as degrees Celsius. A delta T in Celsius is the same as a delta T in Kelvin. This comes out to be 41,200 joules. Now, we also need the energy absorbed by the bomb calorimeter itself. And this is where bomb calorimetry is better than our coffee cup calorimeters. But anyway, that 837 number, that's the joules absor absorbed by the calorimeter per Kelvin. And because we had 8.20 Celsius or 8.20 Kelvin temperature change, you multiply it by that 837 to get this number right here. 
And again, this number is given to you by the manufacturer or there's ways to find it out. And there's something you have to worry about. So this energy was absorbed by the water and this energy was absorbed by the calorimeter. And both of those numbers together reflect the total energy absorbed by the sample. So if you add those two numbers up, it's 48,100 joules. That's the amount of energy technically right now that was absorbed, but the one gram of octane kicked that energy out. You can't create or destroy energy. So that one gram of octane let go of 48,100 joules, exothermic. And the water and the calorimeter absorbed that energy back from the octane. So here what I did is I took the negative of this value. This is the energy that the calorimeter and the water absorbed. The octane released that much energy. It's literally the opposite sign. I divided by a thousand, I turned it into kilojoules because that's what a lot of times people use. And if you've ever seen like values as to kilojoules released per gram or kilojoules released per mole, you literally take this energy. In this case, um, you could turn one gram of octane into moles using the molar mass. You could also take this number and divide by one gram. It would be negative 48.1 kilojoules released per gram. If some of you in engineering have seen these kind of numbers, that's where they get them. All right, they'll get the bomb calorimeter to give you the heat energy, and then they'll do it per gram per mole, something like that. Okay. Will we all um, ever get a chance to um, use one of these bomb calorimeters here at like um, the hood? No, no. We, um, Will we ever need to get the heat transfer to the actual Oh, yeah. So we will do a cheesy version of this with our coffee cup calorimeters. And it's not as cool as this version is right here. But the process is very similar. Um, we have one bomb calorimeter uh, at Mount Hood. And I've never seen it used at an air, so it's not something that we would usually do. Usually this is more of um, like uh, when chemical engineers and focusing on fuels, they would analyze things like that. And nobody at Mount Hood, um, that's not like their specialty, okay? But it's something that we can at least show you with the silly coffee cup. Do we know the heat capacity of the coffee cup? Um, it, it's negligible when I've studied it before, so we will ignore it, all right? But there are ways to do it. Like if you take so much hot water and so much cold water and mix them together, you can figure out the energy. But honestly, um, when I've tried it in the past, it's been negligible. So to summarize what Avenir and I were just talking about, next week's coffee cup calorimeter, it's a, it is a cool way. It's not as cool as bomb calorimetry. You don't have to worry about the energy of the coffee cup. It's negligible. Really cool questions. Okay, that's it for this chapter, and that's totally cool. Um, I want to make one quick announcement. On Friday, I'm going to have a two-hour study session. It's going to start at 9 o'clock, the normal time, but I am going to go until 11 o'clock. Um, we don't have school on Monday, so this is my chance to try and get a little bit more study time in. If you have a class at 10 o'clock, I am not going to release any information about the exam. I'm just going to go over problems. Problems, and I will record it. You can look at it later. But if it works in your schedule, I'd be honored to have you there for some part, all or none of it. Have a great day.